Well, hey, today I'm going to take a little bit of a sidestep out of the book of Proverbs. Um, I didn't have time this week to spend a lot of time in study, and so uh, what I thought we might do today, excuse, I, I mean study in the book of Proverbs, what, what I thought we might do today is talk a little bit about this topic of prayer. You know, last week we had the opportunity to pray for Alex and Irina, and we got to see the result of those prayers, and I just thought, hey, let's lean into that idea. Let's talk about the significance of prayer. And, and what I want to do today is look at a passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 18, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 8 this morning. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there, Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Verse 1, it reads, Now he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. There was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect people, Yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? You know, Jesus tells this parable because he wants his faithful, he wants the elect to understand the significance of persistence in prayer. He wants us to understand that when we come before God, that, that it's not that we just come at one time and say, Lord, would you please bless this? Bless me in this way. Would you please provide in this way? And then just consider it a done deal. God wants us to grow a heart that is persistent in seeking him, that continues to knock on the door of heaven, that continues to pursue God. Persistence is a powerful thing, particularly in our spiritual lives, but even outside of our spiritual lives. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I was a child of the 80s, and Michael Jackson was the king of pop, and he, he sported this, this red jacket with like 20 zippers all over it, and as like a, a five-year-old kid, I thought, man, if I could just get that jacket, then I'd be the cool kid. And so I just started pestering my mom, asking my mom, would you buy it for me? Would you buy it for me? Would you buy it for me? And I think she kind of felt like this judge probably on some level. I don't necessarily like this jacket, but so that Jeff doesn't wear me down, she finally on my birthday bought me this jacket. And I was so proud wearing this, this jacket with all these zippers, taking it to school. Now, how did I get that jacket? Well, obviously it was through my mom but it was through persistence, just asking over and over and over. And what God says is that he is not unlike that. That is, his children come before him, asking again and again. God is faithful. God wants to ask, answer our prayers, but he calls us to be persistent in our prayers. I wanna just draw out a few observations from this passage, and the first one is, is obvious from the focus of the text. We have to be persistent in prayer. Church, we have to be persistent in prayer. It says in verse three that the widow kept coming to him, kept knocking on the door, kept bringing the request. And God says this is how we ought to be in prayer, that we ought to keep coming after Jesus, keep pursuing him, keep knocking on the door of heaven. The point here is that we should not give up in praying for the things that we long to see God do in our lives. Sadly, I think if we were, this is how I, I think the parable might read for many Christians today. There was a woman in a town who approached an unjust judge and requested justice in her case, but when the judge did not immediately respond, she gave up and went home and watched Netflix. 
That might be how it would read today. You see, we live in this culture that is so immediate, where everything is just instant. I mean, you don't even have to hardly leave your house anymore to have things. You can have everything pretty much delivered. You can have groceries delivered. You can have food delivered. You can reach into your fridge and pop things in the microwave, and in 30 seconds, you've got it. If you want to purchase something, I mean, I could, I could purchase all kinds of things on my phone just in an instant. I can update myself on the status of friends just by logging on to social media and see what's going on in their lives. I can have all kinds of gratification just by pulling out my phone. I can go online and I can watch hours and hours and hours of entertainment. Everything in our culture is geared towards immediate gratification, instant gratification. I mean, when was the last time you waited in a line for more than an hour? I mean, if you wait that long in a line, you're just thinking, there is something wrong with this system. I shouldn't have to wait for this, right? Thank God they now have those DMV centers in Safeway. Because the DMV was like the one place where you would still have to wait. But everything in our culture is geared towards immediate results. And yet, when we come before God, what does it say? That if you ask, I'll give it right away? No, he says, I want you to be persistent. Uh, You're going to have to wait. You're going to have to knock on the doors of heaven. I'm not going to answer your prayers right away. Now, think about it this way. What if he did? What if every time you prayed, God just instantly answered your prayers? Would that draw you into a deeper faith and a greater appreciation for who he is? Would that draw you to your knees? Or would it begin to distort how you see God and view him more as a vending machine or a genie where I just bring these requests? God calls us to be persistent in prayer because in that process, Our faith is fortified. Our faith is strengthened. Our character is built up. I love the story of George Mueller, an evangelist in the 1800s. He ran an orphanage that cared for over 10,000 orphans throughout the, uh, the life of that ministry. In his diary, it records the following. In November 1844, I began to pray for the conversion of five individuals. I prayed every day without a single intermission, whether sick or in health, on land, on the sea, or whatever the pressure of my engagements might be. Now just as a a note, George Mueller, I think it was in his 70s that he decided that he wanted to become a missionary. And he began traveling the world as a missionary. And he would preach multiple times a day. So this is a man whose lifestyle Uh, It was very, very, very busy. He records, 18 months elapsed before the first of the five was converted. I thanked God and prayed on for the others. Five years elapsed, and then the second was converted. I thanked God for the second and prayed on for the other three. Day by day, I continued to pray for them. And six years passed before the third was converted. I thanked God for the three and went on praying for the other two. These two remained unconverted. 36 years later, he wrote that the other two were still not converted. He wrote, but I hope in God, I pray on and I look for the answer. They are not converted yet, but they will be. In 1897, 52 years after he began to pray, these two men were finally converted to Jesus after Mueller had passed on. Church, what a picture of persistence in prayer. What a beautiful picture. I wonder who might we pray for? Who's on your list? Who would you just say that, okay, from this day forward, I am gonna be praying for this person and I'm not gonna give up and I'm gonna trust that God is gonna move in this person's life. What a beautiful picture of what it looks like to keep pounding on the doors of heaven. And of course, church, the focus of this, I love how it's not for himself. I mean, this is a man who had great needs in ministry. 
This is a man who, who literally, people would come up to him and be like, we don't have food for the orphans. And he'd be like, okay, well, let's pray. And there's this story of, of a milk cart that was driving by the orphanage. And moments after praying, the person, the milkman's like, you know, my cart broke. This, this milk is gonna spoil. Could you take it for the kids? And you're like, okay. There's God's provisions. I mean, there was just story and story after story of, from, from Mueller's life of how God provided in amazing ways. But his prayers, they weren't for God. I, I just, I need you to bless me. And when we think about our prayers, it's, is, it, is it all in this sphere of God, help me and mine and I and, or is it Lord, would you bless them and I pray for them and I pray God that for this person that you would, you, you with me church? If our prayers are focused on ourselves, we're gonna experience disappointment because God tells us in James that look, you, you don't ask because when you're asking, you're just asking for yourselves. Our persistence in prayer should be for others. God, would you bring them to a knowledge of Christ? Second observation we see in this passage of scripture is, is that we ought to get passionate in prayer. Look at verse seven with me again. It states, and, I, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Who cry out to him day and night? In other words, God will bring justice for those who cry out day and night. Jesus says here that, that if an unjust judge will bring justice when someone is persistent, how much more will our God who is good bring things, good things to those who cry out to him? I was listening to a pastor and he tells me this, this story. He's like, where he kind of, he kind of chastised his congregation. Now this, this pastor had been in, in ministry for years and he was like a big teddy bear, but, but he's like, he tells his congregation, he's like, you guys, I don't get it. When I want something, I go into my prayer cl closet and I close the door and I pray and I get after God. And he says to his congregation, he's like, but some of you guys, when you pray, if God doesn't answer right away, you just give up like it's no big deal. Church, there's a time when we gotta get passionate. There's a time where we've got to get after it. There's a time where we've gotta lift up our voices. There's a time when we have to cry out to God. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> Second Kings, we see uh, the story about Elisha, the prophet, the set, not Elijah, but the second one, Elisha, we read about his death. <clears throat> and as he's dying, the king of Israel, King Joash, comes to him and says, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And the king is, he's honoring Elisha. He's referring to him as, as the strength of, of Israel. The chariots and the horsemen, that was the strength of an army. And so he's honoring Elisha, this prophet who's served the Israelites in such significant ways but he's also concerned because the army is very actively engaged with conflict with the country of Syria. And he's wondering what's gonna happen when you pass away? What's gonna happen when you, we no longer have you? Elisha understands his concern. And so he tells him to take an arrow and shoot it out this window. And he places his hand on the king's back. And, and as he shoots this arrow, Elisha prophesies and prophesies victory for the Israelite army. And then he tells him in verse 18, take the arrows, and it says, and he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them, and he struck three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it but now you will strike down Syria only three times. You know, so often I'd read this and I'd think to myself, well, that's not really fair. I mean, he didn't understand what was at stake. Certainly he didn't understand that the more I hit these arrows, the more we'll defeat our enemies. What's the problem here? The king has no passion. When standing with the man of God who's prophesying victory, he just pounds the arrows a few times. He doesn't get after it and pound them into the ground. In church, there are times when we need to, metaphorically speaking, pound the arrows into the ground. 
We need to get after God. We need to pray with passion. We need to seek after him. There are times when when standing back and just observing is not the appropriate response. There are times where we just have to get after Jesus. You with me? Where we just need to pray and get on our knees. There are times when nothing else will do. We just have to pray to our Lord. Finally, we see in this passage a call to faith. Look at verse eight with me. Jesus says in verse eight, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now when Jesus asks this question, will he find faith on earth? Is he asking a question? Is he curious? Is he seeking information? Is he saying, will I find faith on earth? I don't know. Or is he making a statement? that when the Son of Man returns, there will be a lack of faith on earth. And it's the latter, isn't it? Jesus isn't so much seeking information or asking a question as much as he is stating that when the Son of Man comes back, there will be this lack of faith on earth. But church, that should not be us. We don't want that to be us. We want to be a people that stand in faith. We want to be a people that when we're faced with tough choices and ask the question, "Is is is, is it worth it to be obedient to God? Let's say, you know what, I will stand up. We want to be a people that would pray for those people that don't yet know Jesus, trusting in faith that God, you hear our prayers and you answer our prayers and you are at work. We want to be a people that are fortified in faith. We want to be a people that stand up for our God and trust that he is gonna do great things, that he is gonna do far more than we could ask or imagine. Church, let's be that people. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for your blessings, your goodness, your faithfulness. Lord God, we've, we've witnessed you answering prayers. We've witnessed you doing amazing things in our church. And yet, Lord, we would look at so many around us that, that, requ- that need our prayers, so many, Lord, that we long to see brought into relationship with you. Lord, I pray that we would be a people that pound the arrows into the ground. We would be a people that stand up in faith. We would be a people, Lord, that are persistent in prayer and knock on the doors of heaven that you would do amazing things far more than we could ever ask or imagine. We pray that in all of these things, Lord God, you would receive all the glory and praise, Lord, as we commit ourselves to being a people of prayer. Father, for some of us, we would confess, Lord, this morning that it's been a while since we've been on our knees. It's been a while, Lord God, since we've been in prayer, that, that our prayer closet has been pretty dusty, and, and Lord, we just wanna commit that starting today, Father, would you draw us back to that place of seeking you and praying, Father, Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would fortify and build up our faith as we pray for those around us that need you. And church, if you're here this morning and and maybe you haven't begun a relationship with Jesus Christ, then I'm glad to be able to share with you that, that a relationship with Jesus begins when we put our faith in him. That is believing that he is the son of God who went to the cross and died for our sins. God's word tells us that everyone is dead spiritually. Everyone has sinned. And the result of sin is that it it separates us from the love of God. But God in his love and mercy sent his son to die so that our sins could be washed away and we could have new life in him. And that new life begins when we confess him as our Lord and our savior and commit to following him. If you're here today and you've never made that decision, I'll be in the back of the room and over this As we sing this next song, would you just come and seek me out? And I would love to pray with you about what it means to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And Jesus, and Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen.